Welcome to Chapter 1, The Science of a &P. First, we're going to go over some terms. Anatomy is the study of structure and form. Physiology is the study of function. The structure and form together determine function. An anatomist and a physiologist are going to look at the world in two different ways. An anatomist is going to see this man eating a hamburger, and if they look at the small intestine and study it, they're going to describe the multiple layers of the wall of the small intestine. In comparison, a physiologist would examine how the muscles of the small intestine are propelling food through the digestive tract. Both study the small intestine, but they look at it in very different ways. Levels of Organization What are the building blocks of an entire organism? What is your foundation? You start out at the chemical level. The chemicals come together to form a cell. Multiple cells come together to form a tissue. Multiple tissues come together to form a single organ. Multiple organs come together to form one organ system. This has a function in the body such as the digestive system. It has a function of bringing food in, processing that, absorbing the nutrients, and excreting the rest. When all of those organ systems work together, we produce an organism, you and me. Here we see all of the different organ systems that working together keep you functioning and allow you to pay attention and study right now. This slide shows us all of the different organ systems that are working in your body right now at this very moment. You have a skeletal muscle system providing you support. You have a muscular system that's allowing you to have movement and posture. Your nervous system is helping you read this right now and think about what you're reading. There's a lot going on. Um, there's a couple of organ systems that most people don't even think about, like the endocrine system. Others you only think about when you need them, like the urinary system. All of the organ systems will have to work together for the organism to survive. Let's spend a moment looking at this picture. It has a box around the outside. It's tan color. If you recognize that, that is your skin. It's the outer covering of your entire body. Inside of that on the left, we see a, an arrow as food comes down into the stomach and then nutrients is transferred over into the bloodstream. Your heart is pumping that nutrient-rich blood all over the body to all of the individual cells. It's also pumping blood to the lungs, where fresh oxygen is being put into the red blood cells to be carried out to the body. And down in the bottom right section, we see the kidneys. They're going to filter all of that blood as it travels through the body. And they're producing urine so they can excrete any waste the body has. It's one big functioning system as all of these organ systems are working together. Language of anatomy. It really does feel like it has its own language because you're going to be learning Latin and Greek words in order to describe the different positions of the body, the different markings on the skeleton. It gets kind of interesting, so I hope you're ready for some vocabulary. No one wants to have a doctor who says your left leg has to be amputated and then go to the surgeon and have him accidentally amputate your right leg because you were laying down whenever he worked on you. You were laying down on your belly, which looks different than looking at somebody who's standing up looking at you like their first doctor was. This is something we all have to agree upon. First, we have the anatomic position. The anatomic position is an individual standing upright, feet parallel and flat on the floor, upper limbs at sides, palms facing forward, and your head facing forward. This is going to be that standard anatomical position. A lot of our models are going to be in this position. The model on this slide is also an anatomical position you notice that his palms are facing forward. 
A plane is an imaginary surface passing through the body. Here we see three pictures. The one on the left is coronal plane, or a frontal plane. It is a plane that will pass through the body and separate the front from the back. The mid-sagittal plane creates a left and a right side. If it is mid-sagittal, it happens right on the middle of your body, in the line between your nose and your belly button. The transverse plane is a cross-section. It can be anywhere from your head to your toe, as long as it divides the body into a top and bottom portion. All of these planes create sections, a division of an organ or the body to make internal structures visible. We use these with x-rays, with CT scans, with MRIs, any of the imaging that allows us to look inside of you. Even looking at the same object, a head for example, you see completely different pictures based on which plane you're using. Here on the left, we see the coronal plane. It's, to make, it's dividing the skull into a front and a back portion. We see the mid-sagittal on the right side. That's going to divide the plane into a left and a right. So we see a very different view of the brain from this view. The transverse plane, it's the strangest of the three. It divides the skull up into a top and a bottom, and we're able to see a much different view of the eyeballs. Depending on what a surgeon is looking for, maybe there's a tumor inside of the brain, we can use these three different planes to try to get a good, clear picture of what's going on. Ready for a little practice? What kind of cut is this on the left? It's from the movie 13 Ghosts. Apparently, a piece of glass has come down and cut right through this man. Do you recognize the plane? It's the coronal, or frontal plane. It has separated him into a front and a back. What about here on the right? Do you recognize this vampire? This one's actually a little tricky, but it's pretty much a transverse plane, just a little angled, because it is separating him into a top and a bottom. Next up, we're going to play a video, a little clip from a TV show called Under the Dome, and it's up to you to decide which plane that cow is being dissected on. That poor cow. Now, you may have recognized the plane, though. That was the mid-sagittal plane. We were able to see some of the cow's spine, so it obviously hit pretty much right there in the middle of his body and separated the left and the right side. So that would have been a mid-sagittal. These next couple of slides we won't go over in detail here because we do talk about them a lot in lab. They include anatomic directions, such as superior towards the head or inferior towards the feet, you'll learn a lot more about them, and body cavities. These include our thoracic cavity and our abdominal pelvic cavity. We will talk about serous membranes though. Serous membranes both line the cavities and surround the organ. They do double duty basically. They reduce friction for organs that move, such as the heart or the lungs. The picture shown here is of a fist being pushed into a balloon. This is a really good example of how a serous membrane works. The fist in question could be an organ such as your heart. The heart itself is going, or the fist, is pushed into the balloon, and there's a layer of the balloon that's going to cling very tightly to the heart. That inner layer is going to be the inner layer of the serous membrane. Then the air of the balloon creates a cavity or a space that is not touched by the outer layer of the balloon. That is a really good example of what a serous membrane looks like when it lines the cavity and the organ with a space in between. Now, you may wonder why we need to bother with a serous membrane. Are organs really moving that much? 
Your heart is a good example of an organ that is constantly in motion. Its thick muscular walls are contracting. As they do that, it's going to cause the heart to shift a little bit in its position. Anytime two surfaces rub together, even two soft surfaces, over time we could eventually see some friction and some abrasion developing. Think about how long your heart has been beating for. In my case, it's been beating for over 30 years. We won't say exactly how many, but it's been a long time. So without that serous membrane, friction would have eventually worn away part of that heart cavity lining. Rather than just using our balloon analogy, let's learn the actual names of the serous membranes. The outer membrane that lines the cavity, that is called the parietal layer. The inner layer that covers only the organ itself is called the visceral layer. We use the word visceral for guts sometimes, so that's a good way to remember it. The visceral layer covers the guts. Between the two layers, we have a serous cavity that is filled with a lubricating fluid to help with reducing that friction. The serous membrane that lines the heart and the heart cavity is called the pericardium. So it's the parietal pericardium and the visceral pericardium. Our lungs are called the pleura. So they are the parietal pleura and the visceral pleura. We have finally come to homeostasis. Homeostasis is something that you're going to see in this chapter, then again in chapter 4, in chapter 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Throughout the entire AMP class, we keep coming back to homeostasis. Why? Because it's so important. Let's use an example that is pretty familiar to all of you to explain homeostasis. What is similar about these two houses? They both have front doors, windows, roofs, some, probably that snowy one has some landscaping around it too. Do you think the people inside are comfortable, even though one is in a sunny environment, maybe Houston, and the other one could be in, I don't know, New York? I bet you that the inside of both of these houses is right around 70, 72 degrees. They have probably have the same internal temperature, even though the external temperature is very different. Their central air and heat monitors the temperature and keeps it comfortable. Too hot, and the people inside can die from overheating. Too cold, and they can die from freezing. We obviously have that comfortable temperature that we like to stay at. Now instead of people inside of a house, think of cells inside of a body. Your cells have an ideal temperature they like to be at too. Your brain is going to monitor the internal temperature and tries to keep it there. That's just the start. In addition to the internal temperature, your blood has a glucose level that it likes to stay at, has a certain level of hydration, has electrolyte levels that it needs for optimum performance, and has acid levels in the stomach that it needs to keep at just the right amount. The pH of your blood is 7.4. If it goes any lower than 7.3, we have to use buffers to bring that back, and if it goes any higher than 7.45, we have to use something to bring that down. So in all of these areas, we have that internal thermostat trying to maintain that perfect temperature. Homeostasis is your body's ability to maintain a stable internal environment. When something happens, we call that a stimulus. It's a change in a variable. That change is picked up by a receptor, usually a sensory neuron. It carries the information to a control center. This is usually the brain, but it can also be an endocrine gland in certain cases. The control center decides what needs to be done to return the body to homeostasis. It sends out a command to the effector, a muscle or a gland that can cause a change to bring that back. Hopefully, homeostasis is then restored. Your body works like this to sense, interpret, 
and effect a change, all to maintain that stable internal environment. Let's see an example of how your body reacts whenever it gets a little too hot and those cells are getting uncomfortable. Here we see someone, a lumberjack I guess, out chopping wood in the sun. He's probably getting pretty hot. This stimulus of a little too much heat is picked up by sensory receptors. They then carry that information to the control center. In this case, it's the hypothalamus at the center of the brain. The hypothalamus decides to start sweating and to send more blood to the surface of the skin to allow it to be cooled. Over time, that body temperature begins to come down and get more comfortable for the cells. I hadn't told you yet, but there are actually two types of homeostasis. The one we just saw, where someone's hot and you cool the body off, that's called negative feedback. This chart is a great example of the negative feedback mechanism. We have a variable that can go up or down, and then a set point. In the case of the air conditioning, it's that perfect 68 degrees. That is the set point. For your blood, it's that 7.4, the sweet spot for your pH. It wants to stay there. But that green line is the actual temperature. It goes up and you get too hot. You have to cool yourself off with the AC. Then it gets too cold and we're into the low 60s. So we have to turn the heat on and bring it back up. Then it's too cold again, bring it back down. It's too hot again, bring it back. The actual temperature is constantly oscillating a little bit above 68 and below 68, but we're doing our best to maintain it as close to 68 as possible. That's negative feedback. Negative feedback is the primary method of homeostasis. For anything that we've mentioned before, temperature, blood glucose, electrolyte levels, all of that is maintained by negative feedback. Now if there's a negative feedback, are you surprised to learn that there is a positive feedback? Positive homeostasis is very different in that there is not that set point, perfect air conditioning temperature that we're going for. Instead, this is a feedback that builds on itself and grows bigger and bigger and bigger. Think of starting a forest fire with a match. That fire was very small when it first started. It started little, but it can grow huge. That's really what positive feedback does. It builds on itself. Whereas negative feedback will turn on to try to bring it back down to that set point, Positive feedback just builds. The variable, that green line, doesn't go back down to that set point. It just grows and grows and grows over time until finally a climactic event is reached and then it just drops off. Now, you might think, well, when does this happen? Birth is actually a really good example of a positive feedback mechanism. Birth begins whenever that baby first starts stretching and contracting and wanting to come out. That's going to be picked up by our receptors, which carry that information to the brain, which in response, they are going to produce contractions. Those contractions are going to squeeze the baby, who in turn stretches, picked up by the receptors, goes to the brain, Brain commands more contractions. The contractions squeeze the baby, and the baby stretches. This continues as a cycle over and over and over again until finally, as that variable has grown and the contractions have grown and the baby's reactions have grown, finally a climactic event is reached and the baby is born. When that happens, then the variable slacks off. That stimulus is no longer occurring. Here's that on a graph. That stimulus is increasing, the contractions, the stretching, the variable just keeps going up. Compare this to that set point with the negative feedback in your air conditioning where we just go up and down. There's no time for this. 
we are in a positive feedback loop and this is just going to build on itself until finally something happens, in this case birth. Breastfeeding is another good example of this. When the baby suckles, it causes the nerves to tell the brain to release oxytocin, which releases more milk. The baby drinks the milk, thinks it's wonderful, and suckles some more. So the receptors once again get a stimulus, which goes to the brain and it releases more oxytocin. As the baby suckles, the body produces more milk. This one, though, is a little bit different because it stops when the baby stops suckling. A lot of what the general population thinks about as diseases, we think about as homeostatic imbalances. This is a failure of the homeostatic systems that can lead to diseases and homeostatic imbalances. Diabetes is one example as it occurs when the homeostatic mechanisms for regulating blood glucose are not functioning normally. This lack of control causes uncontrolled blood glucose fluctuations that lead to organ damage. It's all because the body was no longer able to maintain that set point. Aging can also lead to homeostatic imbalances since feedback loops gradually weaken and the chance for illness increases. Heart failure can occur when negative feedback mechanisms are overwhelmed and compensation results in high blood pressure and an enlarged heart. There is a point where your brain would tell your muscles to do something and your muscles may not be able to work properly. As your body gets older, some of these checks and balances it just can't pull off and we see all of those widespread effects. All right, one more topic and then we're done. Medical imaging. On the left, we have radiography. These are x-rays high-level radiation that penetrates solid structures in the body. We mostly use these for bones, teeth, and occasionally tumors. Those solid structures really show up very well on an x-ray. Plus, they're very cheap and easy to do. Next up are ultrasounds. This is whenever you use waves to reflect off of organs to produce a sonogram. These are good for fetal imaging. I know everybody's seen pictures of little babies with their ultrasounds and they're, you're trying to make the shape out and it looks kind of human, but you're not sure. <laughs> they're not the best image. For a really clear image of something other than our bones, a great place to go is a CT scan. These are low intensity x-rays that we're going to take pictures in very small slices. By combining these, we can then make a 3D image out of it. They produce a much sharper image than our ultrasounds, so they're good for tumors, aneurysms, kidney stones, anything that's going to be in the soft tissue, and we have to locate it in a three-dimensional position. The final two are MRI, which uses a strong magnetic field and radio waves to release energy which can be visualized. These are awesome for soft tissue. If you have a muscle injury, it won't do you much good to go get an x-ray. That's going to show you that your bones are still in proper position. But an MRI is going to show you those actual muscles, and they can see if there's any swelling or tears. So we're able to see a lot more of the soft tissue with that MRI. Last, we have the positron emission tomography, or PET. This is where we inject radioactively labeled glucose. When the body starts taking up the glucose, certain areas, a tumor for example, are going to pick up a lot of that sugar and then they're going to concentrate it in that spot in the body. So by coming in and looking for that, we can detect metabolic activity in the tissues. We can use this to detect brain activity or a tumor starting to metastasize. Ah, <sighs> we did it. We got through chapter one. Give yourself a pat on the back and take a relaxing break for a little bit before you keep studying. That was a lot of information that we just went over. I'm glad that you've made it through chapter one with me. Thanks for sticking around all the way to the end. I'll see you in chapter two. Bye.